Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Today's cool fact of the day is that there's a study out there that says people who suffer from depression eat about 55% more chocolate than people who are not depressed. And I like to think, and the researchers like to think, that that's because chocolate scent increases theta brainwaves, which are associated with relaxation. Theta is when you're basically daydreaming or even just dreaming outright. When you're awake, you're in a beta state, awake and kind of hyper-focused, athletic, and you've got this alpha state, which is what we target with 40 years of Zen training, where you want to be able to be relaxed and alert at the same time, ready to both rest but learn. Then we have theta, which is more the realm of intuition and subconscious, and then you have delta, which is deep, deep restorative sleep and some of the less conscious brain waves, but very powerful ones. So chocolate, at least the smell of it, can increase theta, which is kind of cool. In today's show, we're answering questions that you sent in from the blog or via social media like Facebook or YouTube or the Instagram page, all the other places where I've been working hard to put up content that's valuable for you. And thanks, first of all, if you took the time to tell me what you want to hear, to ask a question, that's one of the most valuable things you could do to help Bulletproof, to help me help you. Uh, So just gratitude there. I get a ton of questions every day now, and we pick the very best ones. And if I didn't pick yours, it doesn't mean it wasn't a really good one. It just means that probably someone else didn't also ask it. Keep asking, and I will do my best to answer them, whether it's online, on the forums, on Facebook, or here on the podcast. I'm, lo- I'm looking forward to doing a few more of these Q&A podcasts. If you're watching and uh, you're doing this on YouTube, you see on video, we have a two-camera fancy schmancy set up with different angles and close-ups and all that. And I'm filming in the brand new Bulletproof Biohacking Labs slash studios in my backyard. And I'm going to be filming more of these there, which gets you better audio quality, better video. And sitting next to me is a mysterious gentleman with a slightly nefarious accent. This is none other than Dr. Mark Atkinson, who is our medical director at Bulletproof. And he's also leading the Bulletproof coach training. It's sold out in about 18 hours, but our first coach training ever for people who want to become Bulletproof executive coaches is right before the Bulletproof Conference, October 23rd through 25th. Uh, Mark is a doctor from the UK. He's an internationally renowned pioneer in integrative medicine, has written books on it. He's also very well trained in personal development. Uh, if you've listened to, to my work or to this show, or if you've read the Bulletproof things, you know that at least as much of what has changed my life and made me the, the at least I like to call myself a powerful person I am today, is is mental and psychological and emotional and spiritual. And what I found was that focusing on nutrition and the physical things in the environment that change the cells in your body, that's what gives you the energy to drive personal growth and personal development and trying to fix your brain or fix your thinking or to develop more connections with people or to upgrade your personality. Things like that are really hard to do when you don't have enough electrical energy in your cells because you're toxic. And that's why I spent so much of my energy focusing on, on these things while I did my work upstairs. Mark is here and he's joined Bulletproof and he's the guy I partnered with on our training because he not only has studied those same types of things that I have, but he's also spent many years working on how to teach personal development. The things that I've done, the things that I share when I talk about the Labrador brain, things like that. Mark and I can team up really effectively to help teach and share that level of knowledge because it's not enough to tell you that you need to eat more of the right kinds of fat and stop eating sugar and junk food and things like that. I think that message is getting out there in in a big way and I'm gonna keep pushing it, but there's a lot more to kicking ass than eating more butter and I'm here all in to do everything that I know of and so Mark, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. I think this is the second time you've been on Bulletproof Radio now. Yeah, I think, uh, actually, I think we did it on the Moldy interview. Yeah, yeah. we did the Moldy interview. And so people will be seeing a lot more of you because when we do these Q&As, it helps that you live on Vancouver Island. So you can shoot on up to the studio. We do cryotherapy, hyperbaric oxygen, 
kind of cook our brains a little bit, then we do these kinds of things. And Yeah, you know, it's kind of awesome and exciting. And, and just to kind of reiterate something you mentioned there, which was the importance of attending to the body really before looking at what's going on in the mind and the emotions, because the foundations for high performance is really getting the right fuel in the body to, and the right nutrition. And a lot of people kind of, you know, a lot of people engage in counseling and psychotherapy, whereas really they, actually, they need to be looking at the nutrition first. So I just, yeah. I just want to reiterate that because it's a point that's often kind of missed. You start with the physical body, you upgrade it, you provide the right fuel, you bring out the crypto and remove the kryptonite food, and then you learn how to attend to your emotions and to your mind and to spirituality. Yeah, it makes, uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, one of the things that threw me for a loop, I went to, uh, I think it was a couples or personal growth kind of retreat uh, years ago. And it was like kind of a radical, low-fat, vegan sort of thing. And, and they had a strict rule, like, you may not bring your own food here. And, and I went to this thing, and I was starving the whole time. And if you're going to do inner awareness work and you want to see what's going on in here, but your body's like, for God's sake, eat. I don't have fuel. Yeah. It's actually harder to do the personal growth work. And when you do it right, you should make it as easy as possible to make the most progress, not more challenging. Right? You know, it's kind of like the, the hallmark, um, the real depth of personal development work is, is, is around the ego. And the ego is a master of distraction. So mm -hmm. that's what the ego does. And, and, and one way to think of the ego is it's like this kind of um, fear-based mental construct. It, it's kind of like um, anytime we define ourselves as being this or that, we're in our ego. Anytime we're identified with our thinking or emotions, we're in our ego. And the hallmark of the ego is it's fear-based, it's all about blame, and it's perpetually being distracted from what matters mm -hmm. most. And so if you're not taking care of your physical body, providing your body and brain with the fuel, it exacerbates the very problem that in personal development we're trying to evolve beyond. Because a state of high performance actually lies on the other mm -hmm. side of the ego. So I mean, yeah. and I think this is a theme, as, because you know, I'll be doing these radio shows, um, Q&A with you, that we'll continue to kind of um, explore throughout, because it really gets to the heart of high performance. Um, yeah. You think about those three big ego behaviors, there's sex, there's starvation, and there's stalking. I just made that up. But basically, like, like something's either stalking you or you're stalking something. Yeah. Uh, you're worried about starving and you're worried about reproducing the species. Yeah. So if, if hunger is in there and you're trying to work on all these other behaviors that are related to fear, it just takes up energy. And, and I don't really want to be hungry and, and do that. I, I'm willing to do it. I, I fasted for four days in a cave with a shaman. Like, like you can go there, but to yeah. routinely go there at the times when you're trying to beat your highest performance, yeah. it's counterintuitive, but it's taught so widely in, in some personal development methodologies that that's something that I think we can, we can work to fix. It says, why don't you feel amazing while you do this work? Exactly, I mean, if you go to a lot of personal development retreats, the first thing that happens is they stick you on a vegetarian diet. Yeah. And that's a real issue because um, we're, either, we're either carb dependent or fat dependent. And part of the Bulletproof Diet is about transitioning to having fat as your primary resource for energy. And the beautiful thing with that is that once you try to make that transition over a couple of weeks to having much more healthy, um, high fats, mm -hmm. then you can go for a prolonged period of time without eating. Why? Because your body is now using your body's own store of fat. So I, I often recommend when people do personal development, go away in workshops and retreats, make the transition to the bulletproof diet. Start having more healthy fat, and then you can actually um, you can actually fast for a period of time, yeah. and you don't need to be having regular kind of meals and snacks. You only need regular meals and snacks when you're glucose dependent. It's totally true, and it's it's hard to express how liberating it is as a former three hundred pounder to just be able to look at food and be like, Neh. like I just don't care. Like I could eat it. Yeah, I have a choice. Whereas before, it was it was an addiction, and it wasn't like a yeah. psychological addiction. It was. I don't have enough energy in my prefrontal cortex to regulate my emotions. If I don't eat that, I'm going to kill someone and eat them. And, like, and that's not very nice. You know what? And, and one of the most um, the more causes of low mood and kind of irritability is low blood sugar. Sure. It's kind of functional hypoglycemia. And for those of you who have sugar cravings, sugar addictions, you're sugar sensitive, i.e. like if you're thinking about sugar all the time or eating chocolate all the time, you know what, you can go into a long-winded um, psychology-based kind of a recovery program, or the first thing you can do is you can switch onto the Bulletproof diet, increase your healthy fats and proteins, and normally within a couple of days, those cravings mm -hmm. go. Yep. And, and the, the cool thing is, you don't have to switch on to the Bulletproof diet. Get the roadmap and just kind of go in that direction. Like, like, you don't have to be perfect. That's the whole point. Figure out your major kryptonite foods that cause blood sugar swings, that cause cravings for you, that maybe don't for your neighbor. 
things like lentils that are really problematic for some people, you actually might do great on lentils and people might even be able to be in the same room as you when you're done eating lentils and more power to you if that works. But for a lot of people, it doesn't, especially over time. So figure out the things that really don't cause you to feel good two hours, four hours, 24 hours, 48 hours later, which is why I say eliminate all the kryptonite stuff and then eliminate all the suspects and just see how you feel. But whatever it is, just make a few changes for the better until you get to the mental state you want. And whether or not you're 100% 100% bulletproof. I'm not 100% bulletproof. I'm sure I could have you know, made sure that whatever I ate yesterday was even more bulletproof. Screw perfection. Just like be kind exactly. of good. Exactly. You know, yeah. we don't want to be obsessive about this. And I think yeah. having a relaxed, healthy attitude towards food is hugely important yet yeah, because mm-hmm. really ultimately what this is about is about having a healthy, happy relationship to life and to food. We want to be making sure we enjoy things. Mm-hmm. If you're tense and controlling and stressed around food, then you're missing the point. Because this is really about actually just enjoying life, enjoying enjoying food, having the fuel to enable you to do the things that matter without really having to worry about food too much. So, so Mark, we have a bunch of questions that we listed and one that I don't think is on the list, but one that we should chat about now because yeah. we already talked about it because, well, we're so far off script. It doesn't matter. We're going to talk about stuff you guys care about. Is orthorexia. Yeah, sure. And this is a question that, that I get a lot. And do you have any particular thoughts on it as a physician? Or yeah. I mean, I certainly have the bulletproof perspective on it. But yeah, one absolutely. of the criticisms that people say is, well, bull, yeah. bulletproof diet and paleo and all these things, they're just orthorexia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what is that? let me explain what orthorexia is. Orthorexia is um, a term that, that came up um, about 10, 15 years ago and really describes this compulsive, obsessive focus on the healthy food. Yeah. Um, to the degree to which it causes unnecessary anxiety, it influences and reduces your quality of life, um, and it stops you from engaging uh, in normal relationships in life. And, and so, you know what, there's no doubt there's a whole bunch of people out there who are obsessive. Yeah. And if you obsess and you're stressed and tense around your food, um, then there may be an issue there. And I think it's really helpful for people to actually kind of just say, what's my relationship to food? Now, when it comes to um, Bulletproof, her whole point is to have a relaxed, healthy relationship to food, to enjoy what you do, and to embrace being imperfect. And what that means is it's not about doing things right. It's actually just about discovering what works for you. So the whole Bulletproof roadmap is some healthy principles of eating that you're invited to be playful with and to observe what happens when you have certain foods. And so for those of you that are listening to this, if you do obsess about food and um, that causes you distress, then there may be an issue there and it would be worthwhile you reading about orthorexia. And the key thing is just to acknowledge, you know what, I may have a tendency to obsession, but now I know what's going on, I can come back into some healthy middle ground again. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with seeking counseling if you have emotional eating disorders. And it's entirely possible to choose any diet you can find out there and decide you're a bad person if you don't do that diet, you're a failure if you don't do that diet. And that's not what this is about. The three principles, which makes sense, no matter what your core philosophy is, even if you are a vegetarian or like I was a raw vegan even, the three principles are eat more of the foods that make you strong. There's eat less of the foods that make you weak, these anti-nutrients and things you're sensitive to, and make sure you get lots of vitamins along the way, in that order. That is not an overly prescriptive kind of religious perspective on food, and it's not failure-based. It says if you do those things more often, you're going to be better off. You'll be stronger, and that's what we're working to do. And you know it's kind of, it's okay to, to have sugar, but notice the impact it has on you. Because yeah. if you're sugar sensitive, what's going to happen is it's going to trigger a whole mind-body reaction in which you're going to become obsessive about sugar, you're going to be craving it, thinking about it. Others of you, you can have some sugar from time to time, it's not going to be an issue for you. It's totally, totally true. I just realized I forgot to say something at the beginning of the show. Uh, I was going to say thanks to everyone, but we we got to do it now before yeah. we get into the real questions. Oh, yeah. This came in the mail the other day, and I'm going to hold this up to the camera and maybe stand up to see if you guys can actually see this. Yikes, and drop my microphone while I'm at it. But here, this is, without reflecting anything too weird, wow. That is a Webby Award. And 
If you don't know what the Webbies are, for 19 years, this is kind of like the Grammys of the internet. And Bulletproof Radio won a 2015 uh, Webby Award. Holy crap. Um, thank you. I, I'm, I'm blown away. And I literally just got this in the mail, sort of without any fanfare, and just wanted to say thanks at the beginning of the show, but I forgot because I was saying thanks for giving me good questions. But um, that's, um, that's amazing. Uh, what these are is people I wanted to talk to, conversations I wanted to have for my own benefit so I could learn things and authentically share them with you in a way that's, that's valuable. So to, to be recognized at that level, um, for me, it was a total surprise, and I'm, I'm really grateful for it. So thank you if, if you voted. I don't, I don't even know how they're selected, but whatever somebody out there did, hey, thanks. It's, it's cool. All right, let's get into our questions. Okay. We already burned up like half our show. Oh, let's do, <laughs> Having let's fun. do the questions. Okay, so uh, this question comes from Greg. Uh, he travels a lot dry, driving, mm-hmm. flying. Sometimes it's impossible to get the sleep I need. What is the best way to prepare my body to stay up all night without dying the next day? What's the best way to recover the next day? So it's all really about kind of jet lag. How do we manage jet lag? There are so many things you can do for sleep hacking. One of the most unacknowledged problems with uh, lack of sleep is actually fear of lack of sleep. And we get stuck in this cycle where your body is used to sleeping. And I say your body, it has its own consciousness. It has automated systems that are there to keep you running even if you didn't even have a human brain. So if you were a dog or a deer or a lizard, there are things that would run the same way without you having to be aware of them. And one of those is sleep. And we know that things like a lack of a night's sleep can result in a 40% impairment of your ability to regulate your blood sugar. So you can basically be pre-diabetic after missing a night's sleep. So maybe eating less sugar would be a good idea, except that doesn't really work. I recommend that you eat less sugar, but you actually eat more carbs in the form of safe, clean, low glycemic starches when you're going to miss a night's sleep because you, your body is going to be stressed. It is going to rely on glucose. You want to up your iodine intake. You want to take adrenal glandulars, which allow you to make more adrenaline. And if you have access to it, even small doses of physiologically identical cortisol can do magic if you're going to go hardcore. You're going to have to go to your doctor and say, you know, when I'm really going to miss a night's sleep, I want to support my adrenal glands instead of beating the crap out of them. Yeah, I do that, uh, specifically for jet lag. But the other things uh, that you can do is, is you can get really comfortable with the idea that you are going to miss a night's sleep, but you're going to be fine. Most of the time, your body gets so wound up around this idea, oh my God, I'm going to die because I didn't sleep, that the stress about being tired is worse than being tired. And the single best thing that I know of to help you deal with that feeling of being, of being tired is coffee. The, <laughs> <laughs> the second best thing is modafinil, which is a prescription drug. It's not for everyone. It doesn't work for some people, but for the people for whom it works, which is most of them, it is a profoundly amazing thing to take 100 milligrams, which is the lowest dose. You can even do 50 milligrams and take it. And all of a sudden you just feel like yourself again. And the the stress burden of the fear of being tired, the, the subconscious fear of that, it just goes away because you're actually feeling not tired. And you can power through your day. You can give a world-class speech on stage after flying for 20 hours and being delayed in Hong Kong for eight hours. At least I did. <laughs> and modafinil and a healthy dose of the right coffee in combination along with a high-fat diet and a dose of starch at the same time, which you don't normally want to do. It can turn up your energy where you feel like yourself again. I also use uh, Unfair Advantage. Yeah, it's again one of my products. Anything that will enhance your mitochondrial function is going to help. The other thing that I find is really valuable if you're already used to it is a cold shower. If you're not used to a cold shower, for God's sake, don't do it after missing a night's sleep because it's going to increase your stress. But if you regularly do it, it's actually going to calm your stress. Um, There's also light exposure, bright light, dark light, things like that that are covered pretty well in the blog. I don't know, Mark, yeah, as a physician, what else yeah, would you throw in there? A whole bunch of stuff, really. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, a, it's a good thing to talk about, because, uh, you know, you mentioned something really important. A lot of people create a lot of stress for themselves, worried about not being able to get proper sleep if they travel. Yeah. And that stress is often the issue. Because the attitude I have when I hold is that I just have this absolute certainty that when I fly from Canada to the UK, I won't get jet lag. Yeah. I'm going to be fine. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I'm not kind of telling myself in a positive thinking way. I actually just believe that. I know if yeah. I do a couple of things, I'm going to be okay. 
So you mentioned modafinil. Uh, another really good amino acid is L-tyrosine. Yes. So L-tyrosine, you take 500 to 1,000 milligrams um, in between food. What it does, it converts into adrenaline and noradrenaline, and it just gives you, picks you up. It makes you feel more alive again. People who are adrenally depleted often really benefit from using L-tyrosine. Um, another real thing is that if, if you're on the airplane, is to keep really well hydrated. You know, obviously when you get on the plane, you've got to set your, uh, set your watch to, um, to the time of the destination. Um, melatonin is really important. Um, now I'm in my doctor kind of capacity here, right? But um, if you go to a website called Cochrane, uh, C-O-C-H-R-A-N-E.org, the nice thing about Cochrane is they review a lot of these different issues relating to health. And what they found was that melatonin in the dose of between 0.5 milligrams and 5 milligrams is really effective for preventing jet lag. And what they found was the higher dose actually puts you to sleep more effectively and actually get better quality sleep. Stay away from the slow release melatonin that works uh, less effectively. And you just need to use it for normally three nights in your destination city. So, and they found it's actually much more effective if you're flying from the west to the east. So using melatonin is really important as well. And, and that's the worst. Flying west to the east gives you much worse jet lag than flying yeah. east to west. Um, I used to, to do this thing. I would fly back to where you're from. I'd fly from San Francisco uh, to London, and I'd work in Cambridge. And I'd do this every month for about 18 months. It was brutal. just completely messed me up. So I, I, every test, every flight was a test. I tried sunglasses. I tried lights. I tried yoga. I tried yoga in the park. That was when I first discovered the effects of earthing accidentally. Mm. Like, why does yoga in the park work, but yoga in the hotel room doesn't work? Yeah. And it had to do with discharging static electricity. Yeah. And so there's, there's all these, these crazy things you can do, but I did get to the point where I can fly, and sometimes you'll see it. Like, I'll, I'll have a little bit of inflammation from just a long flight and all that, but my brain is like, it works the whole time. And when I started, it wouldn't. So this absolute knowledge that you can bring it yeah. and that you have a, a tool set. Um, the other tool, and I'll be politically incorrect here, is nicotine. You might think I'm promoting smoking. I'm not. Smoking's bad for you. Vaping probably isn't good for you either. There's some concerns about metal particles. But sublingual nicotine, I'm talking one milligram, a very small dose, maybe two milligrams, or a patch for one or two hours, the smallest size patch, can radically improve your performance, can give you a nice lift. If you do it every other day, it's not addictive, and it's actually good for your brain. It, it's a smart drug. So when you separate nicotine, which has very well-defined benefits for oxygen in the brain and some other really nice fat burning effects and some energy enhancing effects. You separate that out from smoking, which has carbon monoxide and tar and free radicals and all that. You find that there's actually a valuable supplement there. I don't use nicotine more than probably once or twice a week usually, but when I do, it's like, wow, I, I wrote something really good. I was on fire for that presentation. And it's just another thing that you can have in your bag so that what you're like, wow, how am I gonna make it through this meeting? I didn't sleep last night. Well, you know, it's okay to have a cup of coffee and to put a sublingual melatonin uh, or to take a supplement that increases your mitochondria or whatever else you need. Your job is to feel good and to do it in a way that's healthy, and I think you can do it. You know, just one final thing is um, I often fast when, I, when I'm on, on the on the yes. planes, right? Because, like, you know, with a few exceptions, you know, kind of uh, plain food is pretty, pretty dreadful. It, even in right? first class. It, yeah. It's old, leftover, nasty food made in, like, a factory somewhere. Yeah, it's just, it's just not good. It, it's, not, yeah. it's, not, it's not healthy. And so I actually often fast. I just hydrate myself. I fast completely. And so I can go for 12, 24 hours fasting. And then when I'm in my destination city, then I'll reconnect with the meal times there. And that's the important part of it. In your destination yeah. city, you're eating at the right time again. But uh, think, think about fasting as well and, uh, yeah. and just keep hydrated and, and use the melatonin, um, you know, use the L-tyrosine. But also just be open to the possibility that you can travel you know, five, six, seven time zones and not have much of an issue. Be open mm -hmm. to that possibility. Okay. I think, I, I think we're good on that. I like that. I think we're good on that. Okay, next question. So I would, uh, Dave, I'd really appreciate your input on what I should be doing during and after a course of antibiotics for a respiratory infection. If this is going to destroy my gut biome, I'd like to know how to rebuild it with care and purpose. This is a tough one. Uh, it is going to mess with your gut biome. Different antibiotics do different things to different people, but you can pretty much predict if this antibiotic knocks out these strains, it's going to result in a reduction in the, the number of different species that are in your gut. So during the time you're on antibiotics, your biggest risk is actually yeast overgrowth. 
We talk so much about the bacterial biome. The fungal biome in your gut is at least as complex as the bacterial biome, but it's barely studied. They only really started talking about this a few years ago. So candida is the most famous fungus, but other fungi in your gut can also grow out of, out of proportion. So don't eat sugar. And this just matters. This includes honey and maple syrup and crap like that. And it sucks because you're sick and you actually want glucose because your body's trying to, to deal with stress. You can get away with some forms of starch, uh, some starch that's uh, uh, things that I recommend on the Bulletproof Diet, things like moderate amounts of white rice. So you don't have to have hypoglycemia the whole time, but the more sugar you eat and the more, when you get into higher amounts of starch you eat, the more you're gonna be feeding uh, the yeast that's already just lost its natural competitor, these healthy bacteria. You can take probiotics, but honestly, you're going to probably kill most of the probiotics when you're on the antibiotics. So there's limited value in doing that. I typically will take probiotics just because, well, maybe a few of them will live and I'll take them away from the antibiotics. But overall, it's a losing battle. When you're done, that's when you really, really need to start working on what's going on there. So eat lots of vegetables, a big variety of vegetables. Take probiotics. I recommend several of them on the website. Uh, the one I've taken for more than 10 years on and off, I did stop for a few years, but I'm, I'm taking it again. It's called Probiotic 3 uh, from uh, AOR. And Probiotic 3 has a neat form of clostridium, a healthy form that prevents something called C. diff or clostridium difficile, which is a side effect of taking lots of these things. I like homeostatic soil-based organisms, prescript assist or primal defense. And if you tolerate them, carefully fermented foods can be really good for you. Yeah. There are a ton of people who eat yogurt, which does, it actually isn't a very good form of probiotic, or they eat sauerkraut, and they don't actually do very well. Like, like they don't feel good. So what do you mm. think, Mark? Yeah, so uh, I, I love, you know what I really like about this question? I love the fact that at the end of the question said, how do I rebuild it with care and purpose? That tells yeah. me that someone who really is in tune with their health, understands the potential problems of antibiotics, and wants to do it right. So I kind of just, I kind of really appreciate that. Um, and I think it's very relevant, because a lot of people uh, who's listening to this are going to take antibiotics at some time, yeah. and it shouldn't be done lightly. Um, I, I think one of the first things is really important to understand is that the human microbiome um, is a fascinating subject. And you know, um, within the physical body are over 100 trillion microorganisms. We have viruses, we have bacteria, we have fungi, and we've co-evolved with them over millions of years. And now we're starting to realize that what goes on in our gut and the microbiome has a profound influence on performance, on mood, on our health, on immune-related conditions. And so when we take these antibiotics, we have to do it responsibly because they can wipe out a whole bunch of that. And you can take a one dose of, say, something like ciprofloxacin, and they can wipe out your gut flora for up to six months. So there is a responsibility with that. One thing you can do to limit ill effect is actually take something called Saccharomyces boulardii. Yeah. So in Saccharomyces boulardii is really great and it's a really useful probiotic. And it's actually a non-pathogenic yeast. And so it doesn't actually get knocked off by the antibiotics. And so it's the kind of thing that's really good if you go traveling overseas, it can prevent travelers' uh, diarrhea. Um, I recommend taking it whilst you're um, taking antibiotics and that will reduce the probability of diarrhea and antibiotic related side effects. It's also really good for yeast overgrowth. Yeah, because it eats yeast for its fuel, right? Exactly, and it helps to crowd it out. And so, uh, you know, in my clinical work, I've worked with a lot of people with yeast overgrowth and, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And you know, that there are, you, you mentioned one of the keys is, you know, it's not enough to take probiotics, it's not enough to take Saccharomyces boulardii if you have yeast, um, you have to stop sugar. Yep. And what's interesting is when people have yeast overgrowth, they crave sugar. They have wicked <laughs> cravings yes. and it sends them crazy. So you have to come off, you have to go cold turkey, keep really well hydrated. When you do that, support your liver with milk thistle, take the Saccharomyces boulardii. Um, Crepelic acid is really good. That, that would be known as brain octane, by the way, that it has strong antifungal effects. Exactly. So during, during antibiotics, I, I recommend Bulletproof Coffee, actually. Yeah, that's it. So you want to be taking the, um, the brain octane, which is caprylic acid, taken Saccharomyces boulardii. Here's the interesting thing with probiotics. So it was initially thought that there's no point in taking probiotics with antibiotics, but it turns out that actually um, dead probiotics still have some beneficial effects. Some signaling effects, yeah, right? Yeah, it does. So you can actually still take your probiotics, take them a couple of hours away from your antibiotics, but really, you know, once you've stopped the antibiotic course, 
then you want to move to a higher strength probiotic, you know, similar like you know, uh, you know um, a 50 billion, you know, uh, density um, of probiotic. Would you like VSL three or one of those? Yeah, exactly. That, that's well, the other one. Potency. Yeah, take it for okay. like, you know five seven days or so, um, and then it should be pretty good. But you know, if you're faced with taking antibiotics, ask yourself, do I really need to take this? And there's a whole bunch of supplements that you can take, you know, kind of oregano and crapillic acid and berberine, and you, know, you can consult with you know, the health food store um, advisor or herbalist or nutritionist. So, so just be a bit more mindful about it. Um, we used to pop antibiotics yep. like, like nothing. And what we're realizing today is that's breeding a whole next generation of antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria. So we have to do it pretty responsibly now. And if worse comes to worse, you could always do a fecal transplant, but that would yeah. probably be a bad idea unless you really know the donor well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go next. Okay. Um, this is a really, really important question. Uh, so I have brutal insomnia for decades. Uh, would you be willing to address how to even begin hacking severe insomnia issues? This one's from Jules, who was 41. Yeah. Um, that figured that way people who are asking no, and we're just going to talk about your first name. So, and I'm assuming no one can tell who you are from your first name and your age. Insomnia is, when you look at it, that there's two big categories of, of problem. One is, I have a hard time going to sleep, and the other one is, I have a hard time staying asleep. And there's all sorts of, of sub-problems where you may have like a very specialized type of insomnia uh, that requires medical treatment. There's apnea or there's jaw alignment issues that can trigger apnea, which are really, really hard to hack. Uh, although sometimes sleeping on your side can make a huge difference. There's the sleep hack posts. There's about five of them where I've gone through the vast majority of things you can do to just uh, kind of set up your environment for success. A fully dark room with no LEDs and no light coming in through the curtains around the windows. Uh, having a room that's set at 68 degrees or less earthing your, your mattress or your pillowcase with a, a little sheet you can get that helps you do that. Those are baseline things. There's things you can do before you go to sleep. And the things you can do before you go to sleep involve nutrition. Some people just run out of energy, especially when you wake up at, at three or four. Mm -hmm. and you're just, uh, sometimes it's low blood sugar, and sometimes, well, you, if you just had some fat, you'd be fine. So some people take uh, brain octane oil and collagen, the bulletproof upgraded collagen stuff, they do that before bed and they sleep profoundly well. Others just have an egg, right? And they sleep really well. They just needed a, a little bit of fuel. The idea that you should sleep on an empty stomach, what the hell? There's, it doesn't work like that. The mitochondria in your brain, the things that require fuel, if you have no blood sugar or no fat to fuel them, they will not function at full speed. Their job, one of many, is to pump all of the cerebral spinal fluid in from your spine so it can circulate, maybe not all of it, much of it, so it can circulate in your brain and basically wash out these toxic proteins that build up during the day. That's called your glymphatic system. And in the Bulletproof Diet book, I went through the research that shows this is driven by your mitochondria and that if you can increase your mitochondrial function by doing something as revolutionary as having a small snack, <laughs> that you can avoid that dip. Because when you run out of fuel in your brain, you actually get a cortisol spike. And you get an adrenaline spike, and this is what wakes you up. The effect of cortisol and adrenaline are to raise blood glucose. Your brain sees an emergency. There's no fuel. Help. So then you wake up, and then you have these racing thoughts and this stress, and you can even be sweating and have a, a, like heart palpitations. The other thing that works for some people is up to a tablespoon of raw honey, not cooked honey. Raw honey preferentially goes into the liver and helps the liver store glycogen, and liver glycogen fuels the brain more effectively than muscle glycogen. So muscle glycogen tends to go towards the body, liver glycogen tends to go towards the brain. Those aren't hard and fast rules, those are general tendencies. So you get a 22% preference for liver glycogen from raw honey versus cooked honey or plain sugar, which is why for some people that's the magic sleep thing. There's also a whole stack of supplements, and then there's relaxation and breathing exercises, and I typically recommend heart math type exercises for that where you do some deep breaths and you basically open your heart and turn off your fight or flight response. If your problem is going to sleep, that can help dramatically. All right, that was a pretty fast download, what I miss. Yeah, okay, here's what you missed. No, you got, you got quite a lot of it. Here's a couple of things that struck me is I really picked up brutal insomnia. Yeah. So that tells me it's bad. 
anyone who doesn't consistently get a good night's sleep is going to have adrenal fatigue. Yes. Period. Okay, so the adrenals, the two small glands, they sit on top of your kidneys around the back, and their job is to give you enough energy and resilience to deal with life's challenges. Mm -hmm. And if you're under ongoing stress, and that includes sleep deprivation or chronic illness or psychological stress, they eventually become depleted, and that puts you into fight or flight, and then eventually over a period of time, just exhaustion. So I'm guessing you're exhausted. So there's a couple of things. First of all, you need to rehabilitate and improve the health of your adrenal glands. So before Dave mentioned about adrenal glandular, um, people with adrenal fatigue often wake up three to four o'clock in the morning because they're hypoglycemic. So that's why it's a really good idea to switch on to um, a diet that has much more healthy fats and healthy proteins to stabilize their blood sugar levels. I mentioned earlier on about the L-tyrosine. That's really important for people who are adrenally fatigued. The other thing is, I've worked a lot with people with significant insomnia. And I don't know whether this is true for you, Jules, but um, if it is possible that this has its origins in some kind of trauma, yeah. which for some people it is, yeah. then I really encourage you to take a look and work with a practitioner who's trained in either EMDR or brain spotting. And both of those are different types of psychotherapy that are really being shown to be very effective in helping to discharge the emotional component of the traumatic memory. Because what happens is that for some people, they can't sleep well at night time because the nervous system is chronically stuck in the hyperarousal state. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about EMDR and brain spotting is they're both very effective very quickly. And so I just put it out there that if that's a possibility that you work with a practitioner and then what will happen is that will actually calm your nervous system. And I think sometimes the ultimate hack for working with chronic insomnia sometimes is if you're getting yourself into, I think this is a British phrase, a pickle. I mean, I mean kind of, if you get really worked up about trying to get yourself to sleep, is to stop everything. Because you see, sometimes the people who sleep best, they just sleep. Mm. And we can be doing so many different things to try and help us sleep. We can get ourselves so worked up about it. And actually, so another way of working with it is that if you've tried everything, and if you have tried India or brain spotting, and you've tried everything that they have suggested, if it gets to that stage and you've tried everything, nothing's worked, then actually just to let go completely. And to let go of all the hacks, and actually just um, let go of all the techniques, all the supplements, and see if you can get into a, sleep, a healthy sleep power that way. And, you know, for a lot of people I've worked with, that works a treat. Uh, EMDR is, is magic. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, there's so many things you can do therapeutically. I don't know anything that's faster. Uh, I've used it. Um, my wife has used it um, pretty extensively, actually. Yeah. And people, at least the way I looked at this, uh, when I started out many years ago, was, was like, look, if you need therapy, obviously you can't manage yourself. You're probably weak. Uh, like, like this is a very kind of American male perspective on it. Uh, but what's actually going on is there's a lot of stuff you don't, you can't see. You're not supposed to be able to see this. Like it hides from you on purpose and it does that allegedly to enhance your survival. And because this is going on, it's basically code that's invisible to your application in your head. It's the operating system stuff. So EMDR is a way to just go into that like reset mode that your old Windows machine used to have when you hold down F8. And it literally lets you go in and say, oh, that's why it acts that way. Let me just change those settings. So literally in one hour of doing this, that thing that might be keeping you awake can be fixed. Um, I had a, a client once who had really severe trauma. And it turns out one of the reasons was that she tried to go to sleep every night listening to abuse happening as a small child, abuse happening in her house. So her nervous system associated going to sleep with basically violence to her family members. And so every time she'd close her eyes, this was triggered without her conscious knowledge or awareness. She didn't know it was happening. Yeah. She just knew she'd close her eyes and she couldn't sleep and she felt like crap all the time. And it's that kind of thing that EMDR can just completely get rid of, sometimes in one or two sessions, sometimes in, in five or six, but it's, it's so potent. So I'm glad you yeah. brought that up. It's you know, really good. And you know, it's kind of, and also just to realize, you know, um, you know, both Dave and myself, we've done a lot of work on ourselves and, and you don't become a high performing person without doing the inner work. Yeah. And that requires to kind of face reality, to face what has happened and to get the help and support. I've had EMDR, 
to work through trauma. I've had brain spotting as well. And you know what? It's one of the, it is a gift to myself and also a gift to others because when we don't process and deal with the past, it shows up in our relationships and it interferes with our ability to, um, to be a healthy, kind, productive member of society. And so all I say is you know, if, 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 if there is a possibility that trauma was around, particularly when you were younger, to get the help from a licensed professional who is trained in EMDR and brain spotting, which is the next kind of evolution from there. Um, and the great thing about it is I only had two sessions yeah. and it was liberating. I, I, and it was a quantum shift in my consciousness for me. And I'm starting to realize, you know what, it's not, you know, you take care of your body, you take care of your mind. And if there's trauma in the way, there's, there's two big blocks to performance where I come from. It's trauma and addiction. Yep. And if trauma and addictions are in your life, you have to get the professional help. And there's no shame in doing that because I'd say, well, some of the most high performing people I know are people who had issues with trauma, who had issues with addiction, mm -hmm. but you know, they, they got humble. It took a lot of courage to get help. Um, but by dealing with those issues and continuing to work on it on a daily basis, they've gone on to do really good things and live wholesome lives, which, which is a real blessing. So I hope you find that to, uh, to be of help to yourself. All right. Let's, uh, let's see. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. I know we have a lot more questions we wanted to answer. All right. Well, well let's see if we can go through some of them fast. Yeah, sure. what, what do you think? Okay. So I've got uh, Brooke, uh, age 33. Have you done any biohacking? Or any experience with biohacking neuropathy in the legs? I actually have looked at that. Uh, it turns out after my three knee surgeries, I, I have some surgery-related neuropathy in my right leg. And since I was a kid, I've actually had a little bit in my left leg, so I've paid attention to it. And there are some things you can do with running electrical current mm -hmm. uh, that can, can stimulate uh, the nerves to feel things again. But understanding the source of it's important. Yeah. And one of the best things you can do is grow your myelin sheath. And your myelin sheath is this layer of fat that covers your nerves, and it's insulation. Just like an extension cord has this rubbery coating so that electricity can flow without leaking, nerves can have this fatty coating so that electricity can flow up to 3,000 times faster in a well-myelinated nerve than an unmyelinated nerve. So basically there's less resistance. Electricity has to push less hard in order to go through the nerves. And damaged myelin can lead to neuropathy as well as physical things like problems in your lower back, your lower spine. So understanding the cause, understanding if it's related to type 2 diabetes, and then going after the underlying cause while eating enough of especially things like egg yolks that can help your body to grow the myelin is the approach that I tend to take for that. Yeah. What's your medical uh, perspective on yeah, that? There is so much you can do for neuropathy. So you hit the nail on the head, which is you deal with the underlying cause. So if, it's, if you're diabetic... It's about improving your blood sugar. And remember, type 2 diabetes is a reversible condition. And it's reversed through lifestyle change and dietary change. Um, if you've got kidney disease, it's during the kidney disease. Hypothyroidism, um, a big missed cause is vitamin B12 deficiency. Yeah. Yeah, so B12 is really important for the nerves. And there are so many times I come across people who are B12 deficient, who complain of tingling and numbness in the hands or the feet, and they take high-dose um, vitamin B12. It's a very, very safe water-soluble um, uh, vitamin. You can take 5,000 micrograms a day for a, a couple of weeks, and then that actually improves. The other thing is you want to watch out for if you have mercury malcolm fillings, so we know that mercury toxicity can affect nervous function as mm -hmm. well. In terms of supplements, you know, alpha-lipoic acid, uh, we know can help uh, peripheral neuropathy, yeah. particularly for diabetics. Most of the research is on intravenous alpha-lipoic acid, but there's a couple of studies saying taking... 600, 800 milligrams a day of alpha lipoic acid orally can actually help as well. Magnesium can help. There's also some pretty good evidence that you want to take the RALA, which is the, the basically one of the isomers of ALA rather than... Actually, is it R or is it... Yeah, it's R, it's R. versus K. Yeah. So No, not versus K, oh. uh, versus L, thank you. Um, it's K-R-L, uh, potassium RALA is the most preferred, highest performing form that I know about. Um, but basically there's a natural form um, and a mirror image of the natural form that happens when we synthesize things in the lab. So the R form is when we filter out the unnatural stuff and, and that makes a, a difference, a pretty big difference when you yeah. take it orally. You can actually feel it. Um, yeah. The other thing we might want to touch on there, not to cut you off on magnesium, mm -hmm. was 
B12 and folic acid can mimic each other. So if you're short on folic acid or more likely folate because none of you should be taking folic acid, a third of you listening to this right now, folic acid will build up and be toxic for you. And the rest of you, it's probably okay because you can, you can metabolize it. But if you were all taking folate or 5-MTHFR as it's commonly known, then all of you can process it properly and it's one step further down a metabolic pathway. So if you're going to supplement with more B12, that can hide a deficiency of folate. So you might as well take more of the right types of folate. Yeah, exactly. agreed. And uh, with the B12, you're after methylcobalamin as well. Um, just a couple of other things. Um, so uh, topical capsaicin cream is also really good for neuropathy. So capsaicin is the active ingredient in chili peppers. I have a lot of patients who use that. You can buy it from most health food stores. Also microcurrent therapy as well. So microcurrents is the next generation beyond TENS machines. Unlike TENS machines, which uses high strength electricity. So they essentially numb, numb the area. Microcurrent uses the same strength of electricity to regenerate the tissues that's being affected, and, uh, and it's really good for, for pain relief. So my, my father used microcurrent around his eyes to reverse macular degeneration. Absolutely. He absolutely saw it happen. Absolutely. He has to do it every day to keep it reversed, yeah. but holy crap, that's a yeah. big thing. You really can regenerate with microcurrent. It's, it's fantastic. You know, macular degeneration, it's, um, previously you just become blind. Yeah. It was an inevitable path, and you know, with a combination of dietary change, antioxidants, and uh, ocular, micro, um, ocular microcurrent therapy, it's a game changer. You can yeah. actually save your eyesight. That's pretty amazing. It's, it's awesome. I think there's some cool stuff you can do with platelet-rich plasma. Maybe inject that <laughs> in there, too. <laughs> okay, should we do one more? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay, so um, uh, let's do this. So uh, being from Vancouver, with all of the rain and gray weather over the fall and winter, how do you keep from being affected by seasonal affective disorder? How do you cope with the lack of sunlight? When I moved up here about five years ago from the either Nevada or California, like the sort of sunny climbs, up to uh, up here to Vancouver Island, which is at least as gray as Vancouver, it was getting to me. So it turns out there are things you can do with blue light, and I've talked about those a lot in the morning. Blue light exposure can make a difference. But more important than the color spectrum is actually the intensity of the light. So what I did, especially for the first couple of years as I got adjusted, is I went to the hardware store and I got two 500 watt halogen lights, those work lights, and I bolted them to the ceiling above my desk and I put them on a foot switch. So I'd come into the office and I'd press the foot switch and I'd be under sunlight. I mean, intense, like skin getting warm from these lights kind of things. And I did that and it totally fixed things. And it, it made a giant difference. I don't actually need to do that anymore. I adjust it over the course of several years. I supplement my vitamin D. I have a sun tanning lamp at home. And a lot of people benefit from having a, a brighter white light source or even a blue light source. I've experimented with a special little light boxes. I've experimented with little glasses and things like that. But for the most part, just having intense bright light in my environment in that first hour um, when I first woke up, when I first working really, really made a big difference. And after a while, you get more adjusted to it, especially if your vitamin D levels are high enough. Yeah, and just to kind of reiterate the importance of the vitamin D, so, you know, uh, one of the things we're realizing, vitamin D is such an essential nutrient for health. It's important for your immune system, the bone health, your heart health, and also your mood as well. It has anti-cancer properties. Mm -hmm. And really, um, most people who take vitamin D take way too little. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really, you know, um, I used to work with an organization um, that was one of the world's largest research organizations on vitamin D. And most people need to take between six and 10,000 international units per day. Yep. And, you know, you take it, you know, ideally because it's, it's a fat soluble vitamin, so you take it with a fatty kind of meal. Um, and that will just get you to pretty good levels. Um, so, so most of you probably need to take a more vitamin D, that's important. And for seasonal affective disorder, of course, you can buy light boxes. Most people need to use them in the morning. You want to use something that's as strong as about 10,000 lux. Lux is a measure of illuminance. And, you know, some people just need 15 minutes. Others need up to an hour in the morning. Um, but you know, some of you will probably have symptoms of that mimic depression around fall time and winter time and just be open to the possibility it is seasonal affective disorder and there's a lot you can do about it. Vitamin D and the uh, seasonal affective disorder light boxes. When you look at what indigenous people who live in this environment have for a lot longer than, uh, than recent European immigrants like me, 
they, they have a technology and it comes from the world of fungus. It's um, medicinal mushrooms, specifically amanita, which are one of the hallucinogenic mushrooms. There's a traditional remedy where they harvest the mushrooms and they boil them down into a tea, or sorry, not into a tea, into a jam, like basically a, a non-sweet jam. And they would take this, they'd preserve them, and they'd take about a tablespoon of the jam. Apparently the cooking process breaks down a lot of the hallucinogenic stuff. And what this jam does is it makes you immune to the effects of cold, at least largely immune. So you're less concerned about being cold all winter. And it also completely banishes seasonal affective disorder. So this was part of the natural herbal pharmacopoeia used by First Nations. And a lot of this knowledge has been lost, but it's, it's a fascinating thing. Unfortunately, that would be illegal under current law because apparently we're not allowed to do things that work because they might be illegal. I haven't figured out the reasons for that one yet uh, because this stuff is not addictive. But uh, anyhow, that's just an interesting little tidbit about how that works. Okay. I think we're good. There's, there's one more we have to tap. Yeah. Nicole, who's 25, her boyfriend has bad breath and wants to know how to hack that. I think we can fit we that in. We've got to do that. All right. That's a very important cool one. <laughs> Number one, bad breath isn't from brushing your teeth. It's from your gut. It's from what you eat. And there's a pretty rapid thing to do. Probiotics are really good. More vegetables. But take activated charcoal. Yes, I manufacture activated charcoal. No, this is not an infomercial or a pitch. It just works. Mine works better. I know that's why I make it. But if you don't want to buy mine, buy some other stuff. It'll probably work pretty well. You take it, it binds to the stuff in the gut that is producing this. It binds to toxins in the gut, and it's well known to, to reduce these symptoms. You might also try chlorophyll or chlorophyllin. These are other things you can take that bind to the stuff that's causing the problem in the gut. It's not a you didn't brush your teeth problem. It's a you've got something bad growing in your gut problem. He may need to change his diet, and he's probably eating milk which can oftentimes be a trigger, or grains, particularly gluten-based grains or wheat-based grains. You get rid of the kryptonite foods, figure out the suspect foods, take your probiotics and bind some of the toxins, and you will not only get rid of the bad breath, you'll get rid of body odor in a way that's hard to comprehend, but you don't need to take a shower every day when you eat clean. You just don't start to smell for four or five days. That's pretty amazing, and your skin gets much healthier uh, when you don't have to scrub it with chlorinated water every day. So it's pretty amazing what happens when you get the diet tuned in. Yeah, so uh, medical side of things. So uh, when we think of kind of chronic bad breath, um, helicobacter pylori infection can sometimes oh, yeah. have it. So if, if your boyfriend has kind of gastritis, kind of stomach pains, think H. pylori, his doctor can arrange a blood test and H. pylori eradication can correct it. Small intestinal yes. bacterial overgrowth. So I, I noted in, this, in the question that you sent in, he eats a whole bunch of fruits and veggies. You yeah. may be having too many fruits. And yes. so what's happening is it's fermenting in his small intestine and that's creating the problem as well. So maybe getting easy on the fruits, checking for H. pylori. If he does have bloating and distension, abdom abdominal discomfort, probiotics. Um, and you know, um, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, most of the time it comes from the gut. But obviously if he's got gingivitis, inflamed gums. Yeah. Then he needs to floss and get dental hygiene. But the majority of the times it's from the small intestine is the problem. Awesome. So hopefully, Stacey, that just made your life a little bit better because no one wants to kiss someone with bad breath. And a chewing gum full of NutraSweet isn't going to fix the problem and will probably make it worse. All right. That's it for this episode of Bulletproof Radio. If you enjoyed it, you enjoyed the conversation with Mark and me, uh, let me know. So I, I'm happy to do this kind of thing for you if it's beneficial. I tend to focus on bringing guests in and just asking about things where I don't know about them or maybe things where I know a lot, but I just want to get nuances from an expert or help you hear from an expert. So let me know if this is beneficial. If it's beneficial, you liked one of these answers, use the new technology we have called SearchPoint. We're the only blog out there, the only radio show to do this, where we transcribe everything. So all of this is available for you. You can search the text, you can click on the text, and we'll take you to the 30-second clip on YouTube specifically where we talked about this. So you can actually send just the relevant part of the video interview to a friend who cares about this. You can post it to your social. So this is there for you. This knowledge is there for you. And I'm working really hard on making these valuable. Tell me if this works. Tell me what you want more of. Tell me what you want less of. And I'll do that for you. So thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And I'll see you in a couple of days on the next episode of Bulletproof Radio. Mm -hmm. 